Geographically, Japan is a constellation of islands of varying sizes. To be an island is to be isolated. The sea, the Pacific Ocean, the Sea of Japan, separates the island nations of Japan from the East Asian mainland. We see that expressed in this photograph by the great Japanese photographer Shomei Tomatsu, who took photographs of Japan's ecology and geology and titled them Island Life. Yet these islands, if you look, are actually very close to Korea and to China. So Japan's artistic heritage is partly about remarkably unique artistic sensibilities and forms and partly about a very close to connection to China and Korea in their art history. Along with geography, we need to understand the chronology of Japanese art history, the story of change through time. And so we have helpful timeline resources that we're using in this module, this one from Columbia University, which organizes the history that we're, we're going to be examining into first and early period, subdivided into Jomon, Yayoi, and the tomb period, followed by a classical period. Classical because this is when fundamental achievements and aesthetics of Japanese culture come into being that last for its for millennia up until this day. And the classical period then can be subdivided into periods as well. So Japan's Jomon period goes back as far as 10,500 BCE, up until 300 BCE. So it's incredibly ancient, deep, deep past. And what I find fascinating is that these Jomon people, they break the anthropological categories. That is, they were a hunter-gatherer economy, but they lived in settled villages. They had pit dwellings with thatched roofs. Those things don't usually go together. People who live in dwellings, in villages with roofs, they're usually agricultural people. Interestingly, the Jomon people also broke the rule in that they made ceramics. They had highly evolved ceramic technology before they used agriculture. Usually it goes in reverse. If you're a hunter-gatherer, you don't want to be carrying around heavy clay pots. <laughs> you want reed baskets. So this is interestingly the oldest known pottery in the world, and it doesn't quite fit our categories. It's also interesting that the name Jomon period refers to the fact that we have these kind of cord markings, these cord-like designs, which may be a translation of baskets with ropes, uh, kind of like rope systems um, for holding them translated into clay. The other remarkable, absolutely charismatic and mysterious objects from this early period are these dogu figures, which have these coffee bean eyes, as they are described, and have tons of presence, but we're not sure what they mean, because once again, we have no written records of this period. Uh, some scholars have hypothesized some kind of fertility figure since we have these stylized breasts and what could be arms or could be hips on some of them they're ambiguous you'll get to read more about them for the sake of comparison look back neolithic china we had looked at some ceramics made during that prehistoric period where we had a perfect circle we had a smooth finish we had painted lines, interests that will carry forward in Chinese aesthetics. Here in Japan, we actually have what I like to call the exuberantly imperfect. There is no attempt, no desire here to make these smooth and symmetrical. In fact, asymmetry is felt to be something to value. And I relate that to the tactile sense of the material. There's a tremendous tactility in this object that we will see again and again in Japanese art. When we look at the tea ceremony in Japan in the 1500s, and we look at amazing ceramics that were made for that tea ceremony, we'll see as, as, as another example of simple, bold forms and a love of imperfection, the crack, 
the unevenness, those are all felt to give it soulfulness, character. Landscape, gardening, is also full of an, a desire to make it look as if this is the roughness of nature, not a cultivated garden. So that's a kind of an aesthetic that goes across many centuries and millennia of Japanese art. As you move through the module, you will be reading about the Yayoi period, which is when the Japanese people become full-time agriculturalists. Rice agriculture is introduced from Korea. And with that, we start to see bronze being absorbed and being used. And we have the Kofun, the old tomb period. We have burials as the site of art making, similar to what we saw in China and Korea, but these tombs are remarkably idiosyncratic with their keyhole shape. They have moats protecting them, and they also have amazing tomb figures, the haniwa, the clay circle forms used to create a shaman, a warrior, an entire crowd of figures that would protect that tomb, create a barrier between the living and the dead. You will be reading in depth about this. So this might bring you back to the tomb figures that you saw with the Qin Emperor. However, in the Kofun period, these kind of warriors were not underground, but above ground, almost like a picket fence gathered to create a barrier between the living and the dead, rather than guarding the dead in the underground and the afterlife. To help you put all of this into a clear and coherent chronological story, I want you to keep coming back to this wonderful interactive timeline from the University of Pitts Pittsburgh, which shows you these time periods and relates them to the growth of our knowledge based on the archaeology over time. And you can link in to get more detail about each period and to see how our archaeological evidence for this period is much more expansive than for the Jomon culture. And then as you go forward, you'll see that they use the term Yamato period to refer to the period that is both the Kofun period and the Asuka period. It's a good term to use because it's telling you something very important. Yamato, the Japanese word for Japan, is also the name of a clan, the Yamato clan, that becomes the imperial bloodline of the nation. And during this period is actually establishing their claim to royal authority based partly on the religion of Shinto, which we study, and the idea that they are descendant from the Shinto sun goddess Amaratasu. So that means that the Yamato period, which encompasses the Kofun period and the Osaka Asuka period, is an important turning point that leads to an establishment of the imperial culture of Japan's ruling class. And we see that fully in play by the Nara period. Now, Nara is a place. So this time the period is named after the capital, the imperial capital. And the other important event that's happening by this period is that Buddhism has been introduced. It was introduced in the previous Asuka period, and it is now being fully adopted by the imperial family, along with their identity with Shinto and the with Shinto and the sun goddess Amaterasu. So, the Chinese Buddhist art tradition, the use of bronze, the use of amazing technical control, which includes in the waterfall drapery style, that is being absorbed into Japan, as Japan is also having a close relationship to China politically and adopting many elements of Chinese imperial governance, including Confucianism. So by 
the Nara period, we see an important temple, a wooden temple, Horiyuji, a monastery complex built by a Japanese prince, which tells us that Buddhism is so authoritative now, so completely embraced by people in Japan, that the ruling class is seeing it as a complement to Shinto, which they have long based their ruling authority on. And so we see buildings that are very much an adoption of Chinese architecture. In fact, there are many aspects of Chinese ar architecture that scholars study using Japanese buildings like Horiyuji. The pagoda as a form, the roof, because Japan is remarkably good at preserving structures, wooden structures. We'll see that that's connected to the Shinto temple. And most Chinese arch Buddhist architecture from the time period is vanished. So this is actually an important record for us of Chinese culture as well as Japanese culture. This is the oldest wooden temple in the world. And so the pagoda is a form that developed in China as the stupa idea coming in from South Asia, merging with the Han Dynasty watchtower and becoming a pagoda that becomes important in Korea. And we see it here in Japan. The next period that we will see after the Nara period is called the Heian period because the capital is moved from Nara, Nara is right here, to Kyoto. Hien Kyoto. Hien Kyo is the tranquility and peace capital. Capitals were often moved when there were power struggles, including a power struggle with the Buddhist priests who had become very powerful in Nara and rulers were concerned that they had gained too much power. Here I have a goofy little memory device to help you as you move through this chronology that you can think of this as the hey let's turn inward to Japan period. I know that's silly but it doesn't matter. It helps because that's what the Heian period part of what it was. It was a time when Japan cut ties with China and really focused inward. One of the things that will mean for us as we move through the modules is an opportunity to look at the extraordinary Yamatoe painting style. Yamato literally, Yamato literally Japan, so a Japanese style of painting. And we will see how it is deeply related to court culture. Just as we looked at court culture in China, we're going to find that the, cult, the, the culture of the elegant imperial court was extraordinary. It was a, an amazing achievement and it was also oppressive. We'll see how all those things went together. And that will take us up to the Kamakura period. Here is a, a Yamatoe painting that defines the Kamakura, pe Kamakura period for us as the age of the samurai, the samurai shoguns, the military commanders who are literally driving the emperor out of his palace, he's in his pajamas, at the tip of a spear as the palace burns because they are staging a coup d'etat. The emperor essentially is reduced as to a figurehead and the samurai warriors will take control. And that will be the next founding section of Japanese history, Japanese feudalism in which economic and military power is, excuse me, economic and political power is held by military forces. So I remind you to come back and use this interactive timeline, right, where you see the capital Heian Kyo, Kyoto today, and you see the Kamakura period, the capital at Kamakura here. Use this timeline, which is such a nice visual layout, to get you thinking about the flow of one period to the next and to go in and link in to see more closely, oh right, as if you were looking up a word in the dictionary, you're looking up Nara period and you're getting a quick little capsule sized history of the Nara period and what was going on. This will help you as you move through the module.